Uh, hello, everyone. Welcome to the first uh, parallel session on neutrinos. Um, my name is Andre Schultz, and I'll be chairing. Um, so we have a uh, very nice set of talks today. Um, all of the speakers have uh, 15 minutes with five minutes uh, allotted for questions. I will uh, give you a heads up two minutes uh, before the time. Um, and if you want to ask a question, please raise your hand using the Zoom function and I will call on you. Um, okay, so uh, without uh, further ado, uh, let's start with the first talk of the session, which is by uh, Ritam Kundu from the Institute of Physics in Bhubaneswar, India. And the title of the talk is Establishing Non-Maximal 2-3 Mixing with Dune in light of current neutrino oscillation data. Um, are you able to share your slides? Yes, yes, I am okay. sharing. So is it visible now? Um, I'm seeing, yes, I can see them now. Uh, they're not exactly full screen, but they are visible. Yes, now, now they are in full screen mode. That's right, yes. So should I start? Please go ahead, yes. Okay. Thank you for the organizers. Uh, so the title of my talk is Establishing Non-Maximal 2-3 Mixing with Dune in Light of Current Neutrino Oscillation Data. My name is Sritam Kundu. I am from Institute of Physics, Bhubaneswar, India. I have done this work with these people in collaboration and this uh, work is now in submitted to archive in this archive number. Now in this uh, talk, we will first see that status of current oscillation parameters, uh, neutrino oscillation parameters given by different uh, global fit groups. And then we will see the uh, motivation of studying theta to three, deviation of theta to three mixing from its maximal uh, mixing value that is 45 degrees and we will then see role of appearance new mu to new me channel and disappearance of new mu to new new channel in probing this scenario then we will see the this uh, case and then shape level but underground neutrino experiment that is tune and after that we will see deviation of theta to three mixing uh, from its maximal the uh, capability of dune to measure the atmospheric oscillation parameter with the precision we will see that and then we will long con by showing the allowed regions given by Dune in that this atmospheric, atmospheric parameters plane. Now in this light, we are seeing that it is the uh, present global fit scenario given by three neutrino paradigm, uh, three neutrino paradigm given by the three uh, global fit group, Esteban et al. in the first row uh, square. In the second row, the, it is the D cellus et al. And in the third, it is the opposite et al. In the blue line, it is the normal mass ordering, data for normal mass ordering. line is in the three sigma range of the oscillation parameters, where the red shaded region is the one sigma range, and the six dots are the best fit values. In the first column, we are uh, in the first row. There is the uh, solar mixing angle, at, uh, reactor mixing angle, and the atmospheric mixing angle. In the second column, in the second row, it is the uh, solar mass square difference, atmospheric mass square difference, and it is the direct delta C phase. Now we can see here that uh, 
the solar mix is measured with this relative one sigma error but uh, there is some uncertainty uh, on the uh, atmospheric mixing angle and delta cp phase though here if we focus on the uh, first in the atmospheric mixing angle we can see that the uh, is stable and the Kaposi et al has given their uh, uh, best fit value in the lower octant for normal mass order, but it is in the higher octant for converted mass order. Whereas DCLS et al has given their best fit, all the best fits in the, sorry, in the end. But in one case, they uh, have agreed that all the best fit created from its maximal mixing value. This line is by maximal limit in its cases. So we can see that a present global fit scenario has showed values of uh, three. Has deviated from its maximal mixing. Here we can also see that the delta, which is the one, uh, has excluded zero degree to one three degree is one sigma range. Now we will show that we can we know that we uh, two three and lower octant of theta two three, which is atmospheric mixing angle. Now each of uh, flavor I each of the mass I can state in two new you uh, know paradigm can be written as the linear superposition of the flavor eigenstate. Here we can see as it is in two new paradigm, then only one parameter is there, it is theta two three. Now for simplicity, we are, I am considering it in two new paradigm. Here if theta is five degree, then we can see that there is the equal weightage of the two flavors in a single but if it is uh, uh, deviated from lower octant, then we can see that new tau has much more importance in new three. So non-maximal theta two three plays an important role to some theoretical mass model and also help us to uh, exclude tends. Now, if we go uh, to the appearance expression to the new mu to new e appearance channel we can see and uh, that this four term formula we have some taken some approximation where alpha is the ratio of two mass square difference which is less than one and we have taken theta one three is very very small and kept the up to the second order of alpha where the first is dependent on sine square theta two three so it is called atmospheric term second conserving term and fourth term is term which is governed by theta one two here for different theta two three we can uh, see different uh, values of probability so uh, as it is dependent on sine square theta two three so appearance channel uh, good for probing delta cp as it is sine proportional to sine delta cp whereas in disappearance channel we can see that for two different value of theta two three we may get uh, same value of probability it is proportional to sine square two theta two three so it cannot resolve the octant degenerate now we have shown shown here uh, the neutrino oscillation parameters which i have taken from the kaposi et al this paper and uh, here the uh, first column is the parameters they are the best fit value. These columns are the one sigma and three sigma ranges. Where well, they, they Um, Ritam, are you still there? Harry, promise. Upcoming. Hello. 
Yeah, we lost Hello? you for we lost you for about 15 seconds there. Okay. Your, 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 your connection so is, is, is a bit flaky. Visible now? It, it is good now, yes. Is it visible now? Yes, it, it okay. is good now. So uh, we can okay, so we can see now have taken in the light of these oscillation parameters, which I have taken from the capital paper. Uh, done our work for a Dune experiment, where the baseline length is 300 km. And the energy dissolution is also very good. Now, here we have uh, we have used the globe software to, take, uh, to uh, get this total number of events, what a first column is for the lower octant uh, value, where we have in the best fit value of theta to three, uh, say, column is for the maximal mixing and the third one is for the higher octane. Now in each square, if we go horizontally, then we are having delta CP, keeping delta M31 square, thick that is best fit point, where if, where, when I am going from the top to bottom, then we have change the delta m31 square keeping delta cp fixed at that best fit point. here in senel and new pinamot if we change uh, cursor my cursor uh, horizontally then we can see that some of the events of lower octant gets overlapped with maximal mixing cases so we can uh, see that delta cp uh, appears in the appearance channel uh, in the new pinamot where in the disappearance neutrino mode, we can see that some of the events in the del delta M31 square means vertically, if we uh, come, then some of the events get overlap. But if we combine a neutrino and the neutrino, uh, sorry, if we combine appearance and disappearance mode, then we can see that this degeneracies may be resolved. Now, we have taken a by event plot here at x, x axis is you know, disappearance uh, events along the y axis, it is anti neutrino disappearance events. The rate Rita, again, are you still there? We've we've lost you again. Okay. We've we we've lost you again uh, for quite some time. No, events are overlapped with lower octant. Hello. Yeah, we, you, you're, 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 you're popping in and out. We've lost you again for a good 30 seconds. Um, you, you have now, three. Now is it? Is, yeah, you have four so, minutes left of the talk, by the way. F four okay, minutes. Then I, we have, okay, so here we can see that uh, overlapping regions are not uh, in the total event rate, the degeneracies exist. But if we see the event spec and see that uh, they Time we is, uh, delta m31 square degeneracy cannot be uh, delta m31 square can issue. Next, if we see if we have 
then is the deviated once so it is the showing that the deviation from maximal mixing now definition of deviation from maximal mixing and if we have in We come, we've we've lost you again. I'm sorry. Can you hear me? What? sensitivity plot we have seen that uh, dune can exclude that uh, that if uh, uh, at 4.2 sigma confidence level sex is improved at 10 random okay and uh, if we, and then we have seen the appearance and disappearance and so we can see that disappearance but it is not true in hygiene and it is disappearance channel is all taken at uh, if uh, calculation of uh, uh, a consideration of rate and shape analysis reduces the effect of marginalization of delta m v one square total rate analysis. Now you, we have also taken in the exposure plot that if we change the 50 kiloton megawatt years to 100 kiloton megawatt years for establishing non-maximal theta two three, but after the 480 now is it yes yes Ritam, yes. excuse me you have Hello? you have you have one minute Hello? you have one minute okay okay and then your Hello? slide yes we can see the plot now you have one Hello? minute left yes yes is it visible is it visible is it, okay. yes yes, yes. So, so you can see that put a uh, uh, beyond 80 kiloton megawatt years this is Almost there is no significant change, so statistics has no much more role there. And then we have seen the precision measure measure the atmospheric uh, parameter in how much precision Dune can measure. And at the last uh, slide, put note and continue to note, we cannot. Uh, any of the octant uh, if we consider two newton and anti newton mode we can uh, rule out the uh, higher octant but if we can if octant can be excluded even in one sigma following long baseline experiments as uh, thing also we have shown here there is no uh, significant role of uh, establishing non max we've, we've lost your slides we can uh, see that uh, dune can uh, yeah. Ritam, we're seeing your zoom screen and yes. yeah so so if you can maybe show your conclusion slide yes and, yes and yes finish. so so here is my conclusion that dune can improve the current relative uh, one sigma position on this atmospheric parameter by a huge factor if we are considering this benchmark value of this where we have taken 40 kiloton of fiducial mass 1.2 megawatt of uh, beam power and seven years of runtime so that's all Okay, thank you very much uh, for your talk. Are there um, any questions for Ritam? Okay. Um, right, so, so this, I'm, I'm sorry, I'm trying to go through your uh, conclusions. Okay. So this is, so just so to understand correctly, this, this is a study that was done using the beam and not atmospherics, or is this just atmospherics only? Yes, we are only uh, focusing on theta two, three and 
uh, we are trying to show that its deviation from maximal mixing value is 45 degree it is uh, shown by the uh, different data groups the global food groups and it is our main motto to how dune can perform dune can establish this non maximal theta 2 3 with the light of these oscillation parameters given by Kaposi et al. paper. Where they have considered all of the experiments almost, even the super Kamiokant is one to four. Okay, thank you. Yeah, that, that clarifies it for me. Okay, so uh, are there any other questions for Ritam? Okay, if there aren't, then thank you very much uh, for your talk. And we will uh, pass on to the next talk, to the next speaker, Matthew Malik, who uh, will tell us about the hyperchemical experiment uh, status and plans. Thank you, Andre. Are you able to uh, see that? Yes, I can see that. Okay, brilliant. Um, I will apologize in advance. As Sod's law would have it, uh, my neighbor has just started having some workmen in the yard. So if you hear a chainsaw, that's why. Okay. Right, so thank you very much for, um, for organizing and, and sharing. Uh, I'm going to speak to you about, <laughs> excuse me, about the uh, current status of hyper and uh, physics potential. Uh, of course, it's not possible to go through uh, all of the different physics topics of a large multipurpose detector like Hyper-K uh, within the confines of a 15 minute talk. So uh, it's really gonna be a bit of a whistle stop tour of uh, selected highlights uh, with, with lots more to probe, uh, some of which will be described in other talks throughout the conference. So yes, as a uh, outline of this whistle stop tour, we'll start with a discussion of the Hyper-K experiment uh, talk a bit about the design overview and features of the experiment and uh, the current status. And then the remainder of the talk will be broken into two sections, one talking about the particle physics potential of the uh, detector, uh, focusing on uh, neutrino oscillation and proton decay. Uh, and then after that, it will be followed on with a little bit of an overview of what can be done in terms of astroparticle physics. Uh, especially recent work done with uh, supernova sensitivity and also the potential for uh, indirect dark matter detection. Right, so uh, what is Hyper Kamiokande? It is the third chapter in an excellent trilogy. Uh, the Kamioka saga started in the 1980s as so many good sagas uh, and trilogies did uh, with the Kamiokande detector. And that ran for about a decade and a half uh, with a little bit less than a kiloton of, of fiducial mass. Um, it was followed on, in fact, it stopped because its successor, Super Kamiokande, had started. And as I, I think everyone here is probably familiar, Super K is, is still running to this day, uh, more than a quarter century later. Indeed, I point out to my new PhD students that uh, they're working on a detector that's older than they are. Uh, that increased the fiducial volume by more than an order of magnitude, uh, 33 times greater than, than original K, uh, with 22 and a half kilotons of fiducial mass. Um, it's done a tremendous amount of physics over this quarter century and uh, will be followed on very soon by the third chapter, uh, Hyper Kamiokande, which will start uh, in the latter part of this decade and will give us a fiducial mass that's nearly an order of magnitude improvement over what we've been seeing with Super Kamiokande. So that's great. Uh, what are the features of this design? So I've prepared a little Hyper Kamiokande fact sheet to give you a uh, Hyper K at a glass. Uh, it's located, it, or it will be located in the Tochiboro mine in Japan. And that has a rock overburden of uh, about 650 meters for a, shield, a muon shielding of just under um, uh, 1800 meters water equivalent. It's a little bit shallower than the current location of Super Kamiokande, which has a one kilometer overburden. Uh, the size, you can see uh, the dimensions penciled out uh, here in this, uh, in this uh, graphic. So we're talking a, a right cylinder 
with 71 meters height and 68 meters diameter for a total mass of 260 kilotons of water and a shade under 190 of those kilotons is fiducial mass. Uh, it will be instrumented with at least 20% uh, photocathode coverage with the new design of Hamamatsu box and line PMTs, uh, some of which went into Super K uh, recently during the, um, the, the upgrade to prepare for gadolinium loading. And so you can see the, the 50 centimeter PMTs. Um, these <clears throat> look on the outside just like the Super K PMTs, but there are some significant improvements. Uh, for instance, the transit time spread has dropped to half that of SKPMTs to just about a nanosecond. And the quantum, while the transit time spread has improved downwards by a, a factor of two, the quantum efficiency has improved upwards by a factor of two. So these high QE PMTs will have about double the quantum efficiency of what's in SK. Uh, the, these PMTs will be supplemented by additional arrays of the three inch uh, MPMT or multi PMT assemblies. So one of the prototype designs, uh, not settled yet, but one of the designs is shown here. So you've got uh, these roughly the same uh, diameter across, but then uh, you've got better pixelization by spreading out smaller PMTs in different directions. So that's hyper K at the glance. How about some status? Uh, here's a picture from uh, 2015 at the formation of the proto-collaboration meeting, the proto-collaboration rather. Um, a year later, design report was submitted, nice and thick, makes for some excellent bedtime reading. Uh, funding was secured and put into place a couple of years ago. And so we're in a really exciting time with uh, tunnel excavation started um, last year. So we're, we're in the construction phase now and a few years from now, uh, we do expect to start uh, data taking. So what do we expect to do with that data? Here is an, <clears throat> a view from 30,000 feet of the physics program. So we'll start with neutrino oscillation. Uh, even after that quarter century of data taking in Super Kamio Kande, uh, atmospheric neutrinos are still statistics limited. So having an order of magnitude more, um, more fiducial volume will help us um, get uh, ca caught up in what we can learn from uh, atmospheric neutrinos uh, as well, of course, and I'll talk about on the next slide, uh, accelerator neutrinos. So we, besides uh, in, or complementing the, the um, atmospheric neutrinos, here's an aerial view from 30,000 feet of uh, JPARC, uh, which will be shooting its neutrino beam to hyper-K the way it, it has been doing for super-K. Uh, and of course, uh, the main focus for both of these, for atmospheric and accelerator neutrinos, will be to um, it will be to discover leptonic CP violation and also to determine the the mass ordering. Uh, in addition, there'll also be uh, continued work on uh, neutrino oscillation through solar neutrinos. For instance, looking at the transition from uh, vacuum oscillation to MSW oscillation. Uh, moving away now from neutrino oscillation. Uh, proton decay. This will be um, the, the biggest instrumented water detector um, looking for uh, one of its free protons to decay. I'll talk more about that after I, I talk about the accelerator program. Switching from terrestrial neutrino or near terrestrial neutrino sources, I'm, I'm counting the Earth's atmosphere as part of the Earth. Um, we also have uh, neutrino astrophysics topics. So for instance, uh, we, if in the event uh, that the, we are fortunate enough to see the next supernova burst, uh, we've been waiting for more than 30 years now, eventually there will be another supernova neutrino burst. And uh, I've said order, oops, uh, that should be uh, order 10 to 100,000 events expected at 10 kiloparsecs. Um, being very vague on the exact number, because if you look at the different models, uh, the number of events that you that you expect to see is highly model dependent, and in fact, uh, because of that, what we see with hyper K will be a tremendous handle on uh, actually understanding the underlying explosion mechanism of the supernova. I'll talk more about that as well. Uh, while waiting for a supernova burst, we can also look for the elusive uh, supernova relic neutrinos, uh, sometimes known as the the DSNB, um, and that would teach us not about the mechanisms of an individual supernova explosion, but more about the supernova history uh, of the universe. 
Then there's an, a wealth of additional topics. Um, I've picked just one to talk a little bit about, uh, which is indirect uh, dark matter detection, but there's potential for multi-messenger astronomy, uh, gamma ray burst searches, and, and, and so forth. So that's the quick overview. Let's look at uh, in a little more depth at a few of the selected topics. Uh, start with the BEAM program. So this is uh, T2, so-called T2HK. Uh, T, of course, being Tokai, where you've got the beam from uh, JPARC that's been running since 2010 as part of T2K. Uh, you upgrade it and you fire it uh, and then uh, in the same direction, hitting uh, Hyper-K as the successor to Super-K. Um, of course, the much larger detector, the much larger target, meet, uh, automatically means higher statistics. If you want to get full uh, benefit of those statistics. If you want to maximize what you can do with the higher statistics, uh, you're going to have to have better systematics. And working, uh, working out those better systematics means upgrades uh, closer to the near detector. So the existing uh, 280 meter detector, the so-called ND280 at Tokai, will be upgraded and improved. But in addition to this, uh, at a slightly further distance, somewhere at approximately one kilometer, uh, away where the beam is more point-like, uh, there will also be a new intermediate water Cherenkov detector, which is uh, a fascinating topic all in its own right. Lots that one could say about it. Uh, I've chosen to say absolutely nothing because there will be a talk coming up later today, just before six by Nick Prouse that will go into much more detail uh, than I could possibly squeeze in here. So please, I highly recommend you go see Nick's talk. Okay, so that's um, the, the beam program. What, how well can it do? So these are the, um, the, pl the sensitivity plots for excluding um, CP violation of zero. Uh, the assumption that's gone into these simulations is uh, normal mass ordering and it's uh, 10 years of statistics. And so this is, uh, you can see that uh, for discover, sorry, for evidence at the three sigma level, uh, most of the range is, is covered, and of course, that which isn't is the bit that where you're either at or very close to CP conservation. It's very hard to rule out CP conservation if it is actually conserved. Uh, more than half the area is also covered at the, uh, the five sigma level. Um, so what we're looking at here are T decay results and then compared, comparing that with um, the statistics only uh, hyper-K um, projections or the uh, this hyper K with the uh, improved systematics. Uh, once again, underscoring the need for, uh, for these extra uh, detectors and, and uh, detector upgrades to get those systematics. Uh, what we're seeing over here is the, uh, the level of exclusion. So vertical axis is number of sigma where CP's uh, con conservation can be excluded as a function of years of running time, as opposed to here where running time is fixed at 10 years. And you can see uh, based on a couple of different values, minus pi over two and minus pi over four of what the true value might be where, where you see where you end up. It's worth noting that these are only, uh, these plots are made only using uh, the beam data. Um, as I mentioned earlier, we also will be collecting um, atmospheric neutrinos at a rate almost 10 times higher than super K, which is still uh, statistics limited. Uh, the best uh, results for neutrino oscillation are going to be obtained by putting all the data together. And so combining accelerator and atmospheric neutrinos at hyper K gives you multi-baseline sensitivity that may be able to resol resolve the question of neutrino mass ordering. Uh, moving away from oscillation to proton decay uh, in a water Cherenkov detector, the typical signal uh, for e proton decays to E plus pi zero is three electron-like rings. So you've got your proton decays to E plus pi zero, your positron gives you one electron-like ring. Uh, the pi zero, of course, instantly decays to two gammas, which give you two other EM showers. Uh, the total energy is close to the mass of the proton. The total momentum is close to zero because, of course, momentum is conserved. Uh, modern grand unified theories are predicting lifetimes in the 10 to the 35, 10 to the 36 year range. Uh, the current limits from super K are at the 10 to the 34th year level. So for instance, here's super K4 results where you've got uh, the 500 years of atmospheric uh, background give you uh, very few events. Um, so when you normalize to actually a quarter century, you expect effectively no background. 
a signal all goes in the box, but of course, then you look at real data, not Monte Carlo, and you've got nothing there. Uh, there you get your, your limits. Um, once you start going up to uh, an order of magnitude more statistics, these previously negligible backgrounds start to limit your sensitivity. So here's a projection of, of what you could get in terms of proton decay sensitivity at hyper-K in the E plus pi zero mode. Uh, this is super-K. This is the baseline design for hyper-K. Uh, and this is hyper-K with uh, background reduction. So reducing the background will be very important there. Matthew, excuse me, two minutes. Sorry, two minutes? Yes. OK, well, uh, sorry about that. Um, moving to supernova neutrinos to an astrophysical topic. Um, we, I think we're all aware that uh, massive stars end as a core collapse supernova when their nuclear fuel is exhausted. Uh, we expect uh, somewhere between 10 and 100,000 events at hyper-K from a supernova near the galactic center. Most of these are new E bars detected by inverse beta decay. Uh, there are some elastic scatterers and subdominant modes as well. I think what I'll focus my last minute and a half on is a new phenomenological result on uh, supernova model discrimination by a maximum likelihood analysis. So this analysis was done uh, by modeling many different uh, supernova models and progenitor stars, and then uh, running them through a likelihood analysis and comparing them to each other. Uh, each of these basically shows, it's, it's a grid, shows how much the true model looks like the, the, um, the, the reconstructed model, putting them together, um, of the, if it comes on one side of the line, you call it uh, the one model, the other, the, you call it the other model, just depends which is more likelihood. Likely, the likelihood of zero is the vertical line. Uh, with just 300 events, so giving a sensitivity out well beyond the Milky Way, uh, a detector hypercase size with 20% coverage could give you 98 to 100% discrimination, just uh, picking out the true model from the other ones. Uh, with normal hierarchy and more like 97 to 100% for um, inverted hierarchy. So this result was done and published by the Hyper-K collaboration last year in Astrophysical Journal. I think I'll skip the slide on dark matter to get us to the conclusion in time. Uh, Hyper-K is Kamioka's next generation. Statistics power is improved by almost an order of magnitude over Super-K. Uh, and it will incorporate new technologies such as better photosensors and an intermediate water Cherenkov detector. Uh, the, for particle physics, the neutrino oscillation program will combine atmospheric neutrinos and the accelerator program to give world leading sensitivity to leptonic CP violation and resolve the mass ordering. It will also be extremely sensitive to proton decay. I see it as my last chance in my lifetime to see proton decay and I don't intend to retire for another 30 years. Um, astroparticle physics goals, I've talked a bit about supernova neutrinos. There are also other topics like uh, gamma ray bursts, multi-messenger astronomy, and so forth. Uh, the construction phase has begun, tunnels are being excavated, and we expect to see data in a few years. Uh, they say a picture is worth a thousand words, so this very wordy summary can also be uh, put into a few pictures. Uh, Hyper-K is the trilogy to this conclusion. Every chapter so far has done tremendous physics. Uh, we saw Kami Okande get the Nobel Prize for uh, discovering supernova neutrinos. Super-K um, resolved the atmospheric uh, neutrino problem and, uh, and got the 2015 Nobel Prize for discovering neutrino oscillation. A decade from now, who knows, Hyper-K will do great things. Who knows what its capstone achievement will be. Indirect dark matter detection, uh, leptonic CP violation, maybe even proton decay. Thank you very much. And apologies if I'm over time. Thank you very much uh, for this very nice talk. <clears throat> and you've had some excellent help uh, in giving the talk. <laughs> um, so are oh, there yes. any- <laughs> Yes, I guess I have. <laughs> he always picks the, the right moments. Um, are there any questions for Matthew? Um, I, I had a, I was curious about something. So this, this Tochibora mine, how far is it uh, away from the Kamioka mine? It's about uh, eight kilometers away. Okay, and, and it's along the beam line, uh, as in it's the same angle or? It, uh, yes, it's, it's about the same, the same off axis angle. Okay, and my next question, which is also, I guess, less physics-y. So, so previously, I guess, in the, in the old uh, images, the, the idea was that like in the old design of Hyper-K, the, the, 
tanks were kind of cylinders on their side, but now I see it's back to the standing cylinder. Um, can, is there a, like a, a, a reason for this or is it just cheaper to do it this way? So you're thinking of the old uh, two tunnels egg-shaped, uh, two That's very right. long tunnels orientated along the beam line. Uh, ultimately that came down to cost and rock engineering. Um, it's, it's actually structural support um, is, is very difficult for a, a long egg-shaped tunnel like that. Um, and, and effectively what uh, difficult translates into is expensive. Am okay. I still connected? Yes, yes, you are. Thank you. Are there any other questions for Matthew? Okay, if not, I'm going to take the liberty. I'm just going to abuse my position as chair and ask another question, if I may. <laughs> Go for it. Uh, so, in, this was interesting the, the, the supernova model determination. Yes. So, how do you, like, what, what are the parameters? that you're using to differentiate between these models? So the, the main parameters that go into this are the uh, time evolution uh, and the energy distribution, the, the, the energy spectra. Um, and so uh, these, these of course vary because they're dependent on uh, the temperature of, of, the, of the supernova and the uh, transport during the uh, explosion mechanism, uh, during the explosion process rather. Um, and actually, I'm quite surprised. So this, I, I, I'm fairly familiar with this analysis because um, the idea of doing it, it was, was, was my idea. Of course, all the work, I did none of the work. It was done by um, a, a postdoc at uh, King's College, who at the time was my PhD student. Um, and I was quite surprised because I did not expect you know, this level of, um, of sensitivity. Uh, there's another slide of results uh, using that I didn't put in here for time, looking at only 100 events, uh, and you still get over 80% accuracy in your discrimination. 100 events, uh, you, at that point, you're able to actually stre stretch out to, um, to 100 uh, kiloparsecs and, and still collect that many events. So you could have supernovae going beyond not just the Milky Way, but beyond both Magellanic clouds into most of the satellite galaxies of the Milky Way and still be confident you've got about 80% um, accuracy in model determination. Wow, yeah, that, very impressive. I am going really to really excited. Paper. Yeah. And it's much better than I, than I thought going into it. Okay, um, are there any other questions for Matthew? Okay, if uh, not, then- Hi, yeah. hello. Yep. I have one question. Go ahead. Uh, hello, Professor. So my question is, if uh, like uh, in this uh, hyperkamikan, if we are going to add the gadolinium to increase the sensitivity, then how it will be affect to proton decay thing? Like we need pure water. So if we are adding some gadolinium, then how it is going to deteriorate the proton decay model and the especially the, uh, the purity of water and how we can see the deterioration of signal for the proton decay setting. So I'll start by saying the baseline design for hyper Kamiokande is pure water. It, it does not include gadolinium. Um, of course, Super K already has gadolinium in 0.01% uh, loading uh, and is going to triple that next year. And so, you know, I think everybody is watching with great interest to see how it goes in Super K. And if it's quite successful, uh, I think there's a strong case that could be made um, for putting it in hyper-K on the arguments that you've just mentioned. Uh, for proton decay, it will help you reduce your background. You know, if, you can, uh, if you can tag your neutron, well, you shouldn't have an, a, a coincident neutron with a decaying proton. Uh, and many of your, not all, but many of your atmospheric neutrino backgrounds will, so you can reduce it there. Uh, another topic where it would help you is, the, um, is with the beam, it would, uh, with the accelerator program, it would allow you to, dis, uh, to do better distinguishing of your wrong sign background, especially when you're running in, uh, in anti-neutrino mode and have a strong uh, neutrino contamination. So if you look here, I didn't mention it at the time, but you've got a one, this assumes a one to three ratio of running in uh, neutrino versus anti-neutrino mode. And you have significant uh, neutrino contamination in anti-neutrino mode. Uh, gadolinium would help you reduce that contamination through uh, neutron tagging. Uh, the benefits just keep going on. For supernova relic neutrinos, 
especially at the shallower depth of Tochi Bora. Uh, your, the statistics are really only going to help you if you can, if you can uh, kill off your backgrounds and the neutron tag would be useful there as well. Uh, I didn't focus on it on the talk because it's not part of the baseline design, but there is uh, clearly tremendous physics potential that could be realized with the addition of gadolinium. Thank you. Well, Andre, I'm afraid I've, 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 I've wasted all the time you had brought back from the previous speakers. Um, I still have three minutes extra. So yeah, thank you very much. I, I realized I was muted. So thank you very much for the nice talk. Um, and uh, our next talk is Artur Stutz, who will talk about uh, latest three flavor neutrino oscillation results from NOVA. Uh, Artur, are you there? Hello, I'm here. Can you hear me? Yes. Perfect. Okay. Um, let me just share my screen. <clears throat> and hide. Yes. Can you see this? Yep, and I can see it full screen. Please go ahead. Um, thank you to the organizers for organizing this, uh, and I'll pre uh, present the neutrino oscillation results from NOVA. So first I'll talk about neutrino oscillations themselves and what questions we are trying to answer. Uh, we know that neutrinos have a mass since they oscillate, um, and this oscillation is a result of the free neutrino eigen, uh, flavor eigenstates being linear combinations of the free mass eigenstates. So the first question we are trying to answer is, are these mass eigenstates similar in the ordering uh, to the charge lepton mass states? So we can have the normal mass ordering or normal mass hierarchy that we can see on the left-hand side, uh, and we can have the inverted mass ordering. And this manifests in our data as the sign of the delta m squared free tool parameter. Um, so the the neutrino oscillations are governed by the PMNS matrix, which I'm showing here split into three pieces um, just to separate the three different uh, mixing angles. Historically, different experiments were good at measuring different oscillation angles. Now it's a little bit more of a mix and match as the detectors are growing. Um, in NOVA, we are mostly concerned with a theta to three mixing angle and whether it is maximal or not. So whether its value is 45 degrees or whether it's lower, which uh, we call the lower octant, or whether it's higher than 45 degrees, which we call the upper octant of theta to three. Um, we are also interested in the uh, neutrino mat uh, matter and antimatter asymmetry in neutrino sector. So that is the uh, CP violation parameter delta CP that we can see right next to sine squared theta one three here. Um, um, of course, the um, actual there are more phys physics goals at NOVA, but this presentation is just about neutrino oscillations. Uh, so NOVA is a long baseline uh, accelerator beam neutrino experiment. Uh, we generate a beam of mostly muon neutrinos at uh, currently very cold Fermi Lab near Chicago in Illinois, US. Um, and we send these neutrinos on their merry way uh, through US uh, to northern Minnesota, uh, where we detect them in their oscillated state. Uh, so we have two detectors. We first check up on the neutrinos very close to Fermilab, well, at Fermilab, about one kilometer away from the uh, beam source, uh, where we measure neutrinos in their unoscillated state. And then, uh, as I mentioned before, we measure them in their oscillated state, about 810 kilometers away. Um, so how do we use that to measure uh, neutrino oscillations? Uh, so on the left-hand side is what we should see at the far detector. Under the no oscillation hypothesis, we should see a nice distribution of neutrinos with different reconstructed energies. Um, and of course, if neutrinos oscillate, then we, we will see less muon neutrinos. So the location of this deficit uh, from the no oscillation hypothesis can tell us the absolute magnitude of delta m squared three two. So it doesn't necessarily tell us much about the mass ordering itself. Um, and the depth of this deficit can tell us something about sine squared theta to three, but it doesn't necessarily tell us much about the octant, so whether it's higher or lower than 45 degrees. Um, at the same time, we can uh, measure the excess of electron neutrino events. So this is after muon neutrinos oscillate into electron neutrinos. Uh, and here it is important to think about the combination of uh, neutrino and anti-neutrino data really to uh, talk about any sensitivities. 
So these ovals are produced by uh, with our neutrino model uh, by varying the values of delta CP. Delta CP is a circular parameter between zero and two pi, uh, and and it draws such nice ovals. Uh, as we change the octant of theta to three, these ovals can move along the diagonal on the uh, neutrino and anti-neutrino event space. Uh, and if we change the mass ordering, uh, these ovals can move on the anti-diagonal. Uh, so this can tell us something about um, the mass ordering, so the sign of delta m squared three two. Um, and it can also tell us something about um, the octant of theta to three as well as delta CP. So this is our uh, main discovery channel here. Okay, so how do we generate uh, neutrinos? We start with 120 GeV a proton beam that we send onto a thick carbon target. Um, this produces mostly uh, mesons, mostly pions, which we then focus with a set of focusing horns um, to either select positively, to either focus positively charged pions, uh, defocusing negatively charged pions, which will then decay into uh, muon neutrinos. Uh, at the same time, we can reverse the polarity of the horns, uh, which will focus negatively charged pions, which will then decay into mostly un the muon antineutrinos. Um, and a little bit of jargon here, uh, when we reverse the polarity of the horn, we call that reverse horn current. Uh, and this is when we are sending mostly muon antineutrino beam. Forward horn current is when we mostly send a muon neutrino beam. Um, so here I'm just showing uh, the data collected for this specific analysis. It includes data up to early 2020. Uh, and we have collected 13.6 times 10 to 20 proton on target, on the carbon target in the normal forward home current neutrino beam mode. Uh, and we have also collected 12.5 times 10 to 20 proton on carbon target in the reverse home current with the muon anti-neutrino beam. Um, and of course, each one of these modes contains some of the uh, some of the um, wrong sign backgrounds. So this is where, for example, in the, in the forward horn current, we still send few uh, muon antineutrinos. That's what we call the um, wrong sign background, um, and vice versa in the reverse horn current. And we also have some of the irreducible electron neutrino background, which is important to for us to measure for the um, electron neutrino appearance analysis. Uh, okay, so I mentioned we have two NOVA detectors, there's the near and the far. They are functionally identical, uh, which uh, really simplifies the analysis for us. They are made of extruded PVC pipes that are filled with mineral oil doped with uh, aromatic hydrocarbons, so that's our scintillating material. Uh, through each one of these pipes, we send a wavelength shifting fiber that collects light and transports it to the avalanche photodiodes. And uh, on, we, we can see that on the right hand side, and uh, each avalanche photodiode can see about 32 nova cells. And the cells are orientated in horizontal and vertical uh, planes. Um, this is to, for the 3D reconstruction. Uh, and this is all optimized for electron showers, with, uh, and it's 32% active. Uh, so here I'm showing um, neutrino event topologies. Right on the top, we have a muon interaction, charged current interaction uh, that results with a very straight muon, straight and long muon track, and then a short proton track. Uh, we also have uh, right in the middle, charged current electron neutron interaction, uh, where we have much shorter and showery electron. Uh, and then we also have neutral uh, current interaction where the pi zero decays into two gammas. How do we re reconstruct them? Uh, first, these events have to pass through uh, basic selection criteria. So they have to be all contained inside of the detector. Uh, they also have to be inside of the beam uh, time spill window. And this is to reduce many backgrounds, including cosmics. But at the same time, we further reduce cosmics um, via boosted de decision trees. For the reconstruction itself, we are using very modern um, CNN techniques. Uh, this is where, so on the, you can kind of see on the right hand side, we have this neuron track uh, and we do feature extraction through the convolution neural network. Um, so we select different features and then we run neural networks on them. Um, for this specific analysis, the network was greatly improved. 
So uh, for the muon neutrinos, we have 90% efficiency, and for the electron neutrinos, we have 80% efficiency. And, and on the bottom here, we can see the uh, TSA and E plot that shows the different th topologies selected by, uh, by the neural network. Um, okay, so how do we deal with our systematics? The, uh, to the first order, it is done via extrapolation. So we take the advantage of the fact that our detectors are functionally identical. Uh, so this, they have very, very much shared systematics, including the cross section and flux and systematic parameters. Uh, so what we can do is um, fit the Monte Carlo to the near detector data and then extrapolate these as predictions for the far detector. Um, yeah, and this is done uh, via some transformations. We have to transform uh, the reconstruction neutrino energy into the true energy, uh, apply the very well-known far, uh, far to near detector ratios, uh, and then we can apply the oscillation uh, probability curve. So this helps us greatly to also deal with the unknown unknowns, uh, especially in the cross-section model. Uh, and on the right-hand side, we can see just how much of an improvement we can get uh, with this extrapolation technique. Um, and here, it is also very important to note that ANOVA it is, is still very much statistically limited experiment. So if we are to double the amount of data, our results might still change. Uh, speaking of the data, uh, here I'm showing data in the near detector. Uh, so in the middle, for example, we have in the reverse horn current. So these are mostly uh, mu muon antineutrinos. And we can see this wrong sign background. So this is muon neutrino contamination in, in our muon antineutrino beam. Uh, so these um, data samples are used to correct the far detector predictions uh, before applying the uh, oscillation probability curves. At the same time, we do collect electron neutrino samples in our near detector. Uh, and this, uh, this is to reduce the backgrounds that we see in our far detector uh, from our beam. Here, I'm showing the far detector muon neutrino data. Um, so in red, we can see the prediction on the no oscillation hypothesis again. We can see the data and the 2020 best fit. So. In the forward horn current mode, we observe 211 events with the best fit prediction of 222 and background of 8.2 events. Uh, and in the reverse horn current, we observed less. We observed 105 events uh, with the best fit uh, prediction of 105.4 events and background of 2.1. <clears throat> and here I am showing the uh, electron neutrino events in our uh, far detector. So in the reverse home current, most interestingly, we observed 33 events, and our best prediction is 33.2 with background of 14, which does represent, uh, which equates to free sigma evidence uh, of electron neutrino appearance. Uh, so now we can kind of go back to the first slide and uh, start thinking about what does our data say answer about these uh, bigger questions in physics first of all we do not see any strong asymmetry between uh, electron neutrino and anti-electron neutrino appearance uh, in fact at the moment we strongly disfavor the most extreme um, the most extreme points on delta cp space for the inverse mass order and we uh, reject it at about uh, just over three sigma and in the normal mass ordering we rejected at two sigma uh, we do have fairly weak preference towards normal mass ordering and the upper octant of theta to three. So at the moment, our data cannot say too much about these. Um, and here we can see uh, our results against other experiments. So these are the frequentist confidence level uh, levels that are Feldman cousin corrected. Uh, on the top left, we can see that we do have a good agreement with other experiments for delta m squared 3, 2, and for sine squared theta 2, 3. Um, and on the bottom left, we can see comparison against T2K, where we still see uh, a fair bit of overlap in our one sigma intervals, even. Um, so the central value for delta m squared 3, 2 is uh, 2.41. 
um, times 10 to minus 3. We do have a weak preference towards the upper octant of theta to 3, as I mentioned before. And our central delta CP value is 0 0.28 pi, so relatively close to 1. But again, we are still very much statistically limited here. OK, and uh, this is just a summary of all the previous slides. So NOVA does not observe a strong asymmetry between uh, neutrino and antineutrinos. Uh, we do see over four sigma evidence for antineutrino appearance, and we made precision measurements of delta m squared 3, 2, and sine squared theta 2, 3. Uh, up to date, this analysis showed uh, analysis of half of the total expected data that uh, we want to take before uh, 2025. So there will be more coming in the future. Um, at the moment, we are making uh, NOVA model quality improvements for the future uh, oscillation analyses. Um, and a little bit closer in the future, uh, we will present NOVA results again, but reinterpreted uh, using Bayesian formulism. So that will allow us to make easy comparisons with other experiments. Um, and it will also allow us to do some extra studies. And at the same time, there is an ongoing effort from both NOVA and T2K collaborations to produce a joint result with joint data. So that's all from me. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much um, for a very nice talk. Are there any questions for Artur? Please raise your hand and I will call on you. Okay, um, so perhaps I'll start. Um, so you use uh, these uh, neural networks to select the events. Yes. Um, I guess my question is, do you, what are kind of, I guess, the main parameters that are important? Like if you were going to do a box cut analysis to try to do the selection, what, what are the main parameters that are, like, do, do the neural network give you the information? What are the important parameters in this selection? Uh, um, I didn't work on this specific uh, analysis. However, um, if I remember correctly, um, we just insert um, these planes, um, images, and we are only really trying to reconstruct the uh, neutrino flavor out of it. Uh, we have other methods of estimating the uh, neutrino energies. Okay, so, so the neural network basically just does a, an identification like a classification and then you you send this to like a, a more traditional reconstruction algorithm yes okay thank you um okay uh i have a question from uh nick camp all right yeah thanks for the nice talk um i had a question about the joint fit with t2k um mm -hmm. can you talk a little bit about the like difficulties uh that come with the fact that NOVA and T2K use different event generators uh, when trying to like perform a joint fit? Yeah, so um, actually most of the work in the joint fit is actually trying to uh, estimate how different our systematics are and how do we map them together uh, with each other. Um, and this is the biggest ongoing effort at the moment. We are doing many fake data studies with different event generators with uh, slightly different models tuned to each other's, uh, to each other models rather than uh, their own. Um, so yeah, it is, it, it is a challenge. And I think the first analysis is going to be a little bit uh, simpler as in uh, we are not going to have fully merged uh, cross-section models. I see, okay, that makes sense, thank you. Okay, are there any other questions for Arthur? Marco, I noticed you had your hand up earlier it was basically the uh, same uh, question or what was answered with with, with this answer but uh, yeah as i'm speaking thanks very much for the for the nice talk okay um thank you and so thank you arthur i don't see any other further questions so uh we can move on to the next talk which will be given by tristan doyle and that talk is on T2K status and plans. Yeah, hopefully you can hear me and see me and see my slides, which are about to go into full screen mode.
Yes. Now all of these all of these things are a check. So yeah, please go okay, ahead whenever great. you're ready. Yeah. So firstly, thank you to the organizers for the opportunity to give this talk on behalf of the TTK collaboration. Uh, and as you said, I'll present our current status and current plans. So as you've already heard, nutrient oscillations are characterized by the PMNS matrix, which is shown here. Um, and this leads to neutrino oscillation probabilities being dependent on the neutrino mixing angles, the square differences of the mass eigenstates, the energy and the baseline, and a higher order is also the CP violating phase, delta CP. And so there are unanswered questions in the field, including what is the value of delta CP, what is the neutrino mass ordering, and in which octant does theta 2, 3 lie? And this is where the T2K experiment comes in. This is a long baseline neutrino experiment in Japan. We produce our neutrino beam on the east coast at the Japan Proton Accelerator Research Complex. The beam is characterized by a suite of near detectors and then travels through the earth to the Super Kamiokande detector, which is used as a far detector in T2K. We produce well leading measurements of theta 2, 3, delta m 3, 2 squared, and delta CP and improve measurements of theta 1, 3 from accelerator neutrinos. And we also have some limited sensitivity to the neutrino mass ordering. As well as oscillations, we also make neutrino cross-section measurements and conduct searches for exotic phenomena. Our beam flux model is informed by uh, hadron production data from NA61 and SHINE. In uh, pre-2020 analyses, we use the so-called thin target data um, but since 2020, our analysis have included a T2K replica target uh, data, which allows us to reduce our flux uncertainty um, from 10% in the peak to about 5%. And uh, the thin target uncertainty is shown here by the black dotted line, and the replica target is shown by the black solid line. And in future iterations of the analysis, we have even more uh, replica target data that will be analyzed and incorporated to reduce our flux uncertainties. As I said, we have a suite of near detectors and these lie 280 meters downstream of the beam target. We have an on-axis detector in grid, and this monitors our beam intensity, direction, and stability, as well as allowing us to constrain our flux systematic uncertainties. Uh, one of our off-axis detectors is the ND280, which sits two and a half degrees off beam axis, uh, just like the far detector. And this consists of several subdetectors surrounded by a 0.2 Tesla magnetic field. And with this detector, we measure neutrino interactions, our intrinsic uh, electron neutrino contamination in the beam, and also the wrong sign background. So those are neutrinos in the anti-neutrino mode and anti-neutrinos in the neutrino mode. And this detector is also used to constrain our flux and cross-section systematic uncertainties. Uh, we make cross-section measurements at the near detector and our near detector flux is shown uh, by this gray shaded area and you can see at the flux peak at around 600 MeV the neutrino cross-section is dominated by CCQE interactions so these are quasi-elastic neutrino interactions that produce a muon and a proton um, but there are also um, contributions from other interaction types including resonant interactions and deep inelastic scattering uh, and others. Uh, we measure the cross sections of these processes on both um, water and on hydrocarbon and we have published seven new results in the last two years. We perform two oscillation analyses. Uh, the first is a frequentist analysis. So in this case we take our flux model informed by NS61 Shine and Ingrid uh, our cross-section model and also our near detector model to fit our near detector uh, simulation to our near detector data. And this provides constraint on the flux and cross-section models that we pass to the far detector, um, which is combined with the far detector model to fit to the far detector data. And this allows us to extract the oscillation parameters that we're trying to measure. The second approach is a Bayesian analysis, which does a joint fit. Um, so this is simultaneous fit to near and far detector data. Um, and both analyses produce consistent results and work as cross checks for each other. 
in the oscillation and oscillation analysis, we select events um, at the near detector using the topologies. Um, so we have selections in both FGD1 and FGD2, and we select events based on the pion content of the final state. So we have events with no pions, events with a single pion, um, and then everything else is in the CC other category. And we have equivalent selections in the antineutrino mode. Um, and in the antineutrino mode, we also select uh, the wrong sign background neutrino events, giving a total of 18 samples of the new detector. Uh, the fire detector Super Kamikande, as I said earlier, is two and a half degrees off axis. And this is a 50 kiloton water Cherenkov detector that is now being loaded with gadolinium sulfate, as we heard earlier. And this will greatly improve the neutron tagging efficiency. But even without that, the detector has excellent particle identification capability, such that less than 1% of muons are misidentified as electrons. And we use this ring shape analysis. Um, and you can see here at the bottom, a rather sharp ring for a muon uh, event and uh, a more fuzzy ring for an electron-like event. Uh, the, at the fire detector, we have five samples in the oscillation analysis. In both neutrino mode and antineutrino mode, we select events with a single sharp muon-like ring. And the neutrino mode sample is shown here. We also select events with a single fuzzy electron-like ring in both neutrino and antineutrino modes. And then in the neutrino mode, we have an additional sample where we select events with one electron-like ring and one Michel electron ring. And so this is essentially a CC one pi event selection at the fire detector. As I said, we use the near detector to constrain systematic uncertainties at, that are used at the fire detector. And this is shown both in the plot in the upper right and in the table below. In the plot, we have the uh, predicted fire detector spectra for the neutrino mode uh, muon-like sample. The blue bands showing the pre-near pre detector fit uncertainties and the red bands showing the uncertainties after the near detector constraint. Below in the table, you can see the one ring muon samples have the greatest reduction in systematic uncertainties, about a factor of three. But the electron like samples also have uh, relatively large um, systematic reductions as well. So, measuring the oscillation parameters, we perform analyses both with and without the reactor constraint. And the results for theta 1, 3 are shown here. Uh, red is including the constraint from the reactor experiments and blue is without, compared to the reactor constraint itself shown by the green band. And you can see there's good agreement between the T2K result and between the reactor data. On the following slides, when I show the PMS parameters, the reactor constraint is included in the analysis. Here we have 2D contours for theta 2, 3 and delta 3, 2, uh, delta M 3, 2 squared. On the left are the T2K results. Uh, blue are the normal ordering contours and orange are the inverted ordering. And on the right, T2K is compared to other uh, experiments measuring these parameters. At the bottom, I have a table of posterior probabilities uh, for different scenarios. And you can see there's a slight preference here for the upper octant of theta 2, 3 and the normal mass ordering. Uh, these are the results of our delta CP measurements from the frequentist analysis on the left, the delta chi squared distribution, and the posterior probability density on the right from the Bayesian approach. 35% uh, of values are excluded at three sigma when marginalized across the mass orderings, um, and CP conserving values zero and pi are excluded at the 90% level. Uh, and we've demonstrated the robustness of our fits against a wide range of biases in our systematic model. Um, and the largest changes we've seen would cause the interval to move by less than 0. Uh, the edges of the interval to move by less than 0. 0.08, meaning that these conclusions would remain uh, intact. So those are the results that we presented in 2020 and now looking to the future. The next iteration of the oscillation analysis will include several new samples. Um, at the near detector, we're splitting the uh, CC zero pi sample based on the presence or absence of protons. 
And these two subsamples have different sensitivity to nuclear effects. And so shown at the bottom are the Q3, Q0 distributions um, on the left for the Neves et al. 2B2H model, which has this characteristic two peak structure. And you can see when we separate our CC0 pi sample bit uh, into zero protons and N protons, we have good selections, uh, good separation of these two peaks uh, in the model. Another change at the knee detector is isolation of CC pi zero interactions by looking for photons in the ECAL and in the TPC. And this sample is dominated by DIS and multiple pion production, which is shown by this blue band here, um, with significant contribution as well from resonant pi zero production shown in the green band. And the photon tag also improves the purity of other near detector samples. At the far detector, the new sample is this so-called uh, multi-ring sample. These are uh, muon neutrino charge current events with two muon-like rings and either one or two decay electron-like rings. Uh, this results in a 20% increase in the number of events selected at the far detector and is expected to give slight increase in sensitivity to theta 2, 3 and delta M 3, 2 squared. And the sample itself is complementary to the other uh, pion sample that we have at the fire detector. At the last run, our beam was running stably at 515 kilowatts, but we have two upgrades planned for the near future. Firstly, in the next um, year or so, we have a main ring power supply upgrade which will see our beam power go above 800 kilowatts. And then another uh, upgrade in a few years time, we'll see the beam power go above one megawatt by 2027 in time for hypergear coming online. Uh, coming this year is an upgrade to the ND280. Excuse me, we're, you've got three minutes left. Yeah, no problem. Uh, we're replacing the Pi Zero detector with a so-called Super FGD uh, which consists of two million one centimeter cubes uh, of scintillator that all have individual readout. And this is sandwiched between two high angle TPCs and the whole thing is surrounded by a time of flight detector. And this gives the multitude of physics improvements. So we have improved selection efficiency across muon angle, particularly uh, high angle muons and backward going muons. We have a lower proton reconstruction threshold uh, and are able to reconstruct neutron kinematics. And the Super FGD itself is more target mass, meaning we'll select, uh, we'll have more interactions at the near detector. Uh, and all of these things combined will allow us to reduce key systematic uncertainties in both the flux and cross-section models. Uh, we have two uh, joint fits with other experiments ongoing um, at the moment, uh, as Arta mentioned, there's the TTK Nova joint fit, and we also have a TTK uh, SuperK joint fit as well. And these combine the data from the different experiments uh, of different energies and different baselines to break degeneracies and discrepancies um, and allow us to understand the systematic correlations between experiments. And these fits will be the first to have both consistent uh, statistical treatment using the full likelihoods of both experiments and having the oscillation parameters uh, correlated. So to summarize, TTK is a world leading, uh, producing world leading measurements of PM and S parameters. Uh, we've produced seven new cross-section results in the last couple of years. The latest oscillation results show that CP conservation is excluded at the 90% level. And there's a slight preference for normal ordering and the upper octant. We have new near and fire detector samples coming in the next oscillation analysis, and there will be even more in the future. We have BEAM and ND280 upgrades coming uh, soon. And there are many more developments I didn't have chance to discuss today, including uh, more data. Uh, our latest run included uh, the gadolinium loaded super K at 0.01%. We have new off axis detectors, Wagashi and Baby Mind. And we have an improved cross section model and new cross section measurements as well. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much uh, for the nice talk. Um, are there any questions for Tristan? Please go ahead and raise your hand. 
Okay, um, then let me start and uh, maybe someone can ask a question later. So um, on slide 10, uh, you showed a distribution of these neutrinos. So in this plot on the left, there seems to be a dip uh, mm -hmm. at yeah. about 2 MeV. So is that significant? Do you know where that's coming from or what's going on there? Um, no, so if you take into account the uh, Monte Carlo statistical uncertainty as well, we find that this dip is consistent with our Monte Carlo. It's just statistical fluctuation. Okay, thank you. Um, does anyone else? Uh, Arthur, you have a question. Go ahead. Um, yeah, uh, thank you for the great talk. Do you know what's the timeline for the T2K, joint T2K and SK analysis? That's, that's quite interesting. Um, so, yeah, both of these joint fits are uh, ongoing. Um, I think probably T2K and Nova will come first, but yeah, I think the timeline roughly is a couple of years, hopefully. I see, I see, thank you. Okay, any other questions for Tristan? Uh, I have one more, if I may, on slide 17, when you mm -hmm. mentioned these double muon, uh, two mu muon-like rings, what, what what are these events? Uh, perhaps you said it and I missed it. Uh, yeah, so the first muon-like ring would come from the muon itself produced in the charge current interaction. And then the second muon can come from uh, pion decay. Um, and then either one or both of these muons can then decay uh, well, they both will decay, but can decay above threshold to produce the elect fuzzy electron ring that we see. Okay, because y you can tell a pion from a muon, is my understanding, or reasonably well, right? So these would be like low energy mm -hmm. pions? Uh, yeah, they can be uh, low energy or uh, relatively high energy. Okay. The higher, the higher energy ones will have the both uh, electron mic rings. Okay. Okay. Thank you very much again. Uh, last chance to ask a question to Tristan. Okay. If not, then thank you again for the nice talk. Thanks. And uh, we will move on to the last talk of this session. Uh, Davide Basilico. Uh, yes, can you hear me? Yes, I can hear okay, you. Okay, perfect. Uh, so, uh, Davide will talk about the Juno experiment, uh, physics, goals, and current status. Okay. So, can you see the slides? Yes, they're not full screen. Yeah, of course. Now you should see full screen. That is, yes. Okay. All right, please go ahead. Okay, thank you. I would like to thank the organizers for this talk. This talk is uh, on behalf of the Juno collaboration. I will review the current status of the Juno experiments and the physics goal that we want to achieve. So Juno will be the largest liquid scintillator detector ever built in the southern of China. And uh, his basic main goal is given by the determination of the neutrino mass ordering. And this will be done by analyzing the signature of reactor and tiny neutrinos in a medium baseline configuration. So uh, here you can see the detector, the, uh, the design of the detector. Uh, so the core, the Juno core is given by a central liquid scintillator of huge mass. We are talking about 20 kilotons of liquid scintillator. And the detector is equipped with uh, more than 43,000 uh, PMTs, which uh, we collect the scintillation light of events uh, uh, occurring inside the liquid scintillator. So the detector is placed underground and is uh, endowed with a, a, a sequence of passive sheeting layers in order to suppress as possible the external backgrounds. So the key, the key, the key requirements of the experiment will be, uh, as I said previously, the a uh, huge mass, the huge active mass that guarantees a very large exposure, the low background levels, which are achieved by uh, internal radio purity levels and the passive shielding, 
and uh, a very high energy resolution and uh, unprecedented energy resolution for the scintillator detectors. This is given by the, scintillate, the high scintillator field combined with the high, very high PMTs coverage and the high quantum efficiencies of the PMTs. So Juno wants to study um, proper, the fundamental properties of neutrino, and in particular the flavor oscillation. As you already know, these are given, these are generated to the fact that neutrino flavor eigenstates are different with respect to neutrino mass eigenstates. And we can parameterize the flavor eigenstates as a linear combination of mass eigenstates uh, by means of a mat mixing matrix that you can see on the right of this slide. And in particular, you, we want to study the oscillation probability um, for a given flavor, for a given couple of flavor. And um, this is related clearly on the neutrino mass ordering. Uh, indeed, one of the um, still open problems of fundamental neutrino physics is given by the fact that we currently don't know which is the correct neutrino mass ordering. We know that uh, uh, we are we have uh, two possibilities that you can see uh, you can see a scheme on the left uh, part of the slide the so-called normal ordering and the so-called inverted ordering so um, the, this determination is uh, really important since it is connected to other many physics neutrino physics over problems like the possibility of leptonic cp relation and this is also related to the neutrino less uh, uh, beta double decay, which is connected to the intrinsic nature of a neutrino, which is, if it is Mariano or, or Fermi particle, and also the octant of uh, the theta 2 3. So um, Juno wants to, uh, Juno is an experiment which is optimized to understand which is the, co the correct neutrino mass ordering. Indeed, you can see on the left part of the slide. On the top, the survival probability for a given electronic antineutrino as a function of the L over E, so um, this baseline distance over neutrino energy. And you can see that, uh, and you can see in two different colors, in yellow and in green, the two possible scenarios, normal ordering or inverted ordering. And you can see that uh, Juno is as an L over E ratio optimized to catch uh, the highest possible relative difference between the two scenarios. You can see on the bottom part of the slide, the relative difference of the two probability, two survival probability that you see on the top. And uh, so the optimized baseline allows Juno to study uh, for the first time, as we will see, the interference of the two uh, oscillation fast and slow. So Juno wants to study um, the profile of uh, reactor antineutrinos, which are uh, emitted by nuclear reactors placed at uh, 50, around 50 kilometers from the, from the detector itself. So these neutrinos are emitted, these antineutrinos are emitted from beta decays of uh, fragments of uh, thanks to the fission of uranium and um, plutonium isotopes. So you can see on the plot on the left, the typical antineutrino emission spectrum as a function of the energy, which will, uh, uh, we, which will be detected by Juno, which is a combination of the decreasing reactor flux with energy and increasing uh, cross section. So you can see that there is a, is a typical uh, bump around the four uh, MeV that we expect to see on data. This is clearly the antineutrino spectrum without oscillation, without uh, flavor oscillations. So what do we expect when uh, we also uh, include the oscillation in the two scenarios? Uh, you can see on the, the plot the expected spectrum, assuming no oscillation in a solid gray line and assuming the normal or inverted ordering and uh, of course oscillations, flavor oscillations, respectively in blue and red. You see clearly that there are two, two kinds of oscillations that uh, in some sense interfere. You see this, the slow oscillation, which is given by the theta one two mixing angle and the delta squared two and one. 
and also there are a sequence of fast oscillations. So Juno is the first experiment able to study the, both the slow and fast oscillations. And in particular, Juno will be able to study the interference pattern due to this kind of oscillations. And this interference pattern depends on, um, on neutrino mass ordering. So according to the um, most favorable um, ordering that we, we see on data, Juno will be able to um, understand which is the most favorable scenario. Juno will be able to detect neutrinos thanks to the inverse beta decay reaction that you see schematized on the left, and in particular, which is given by a prompt event, which is given by the um, annihilation of uh, the positron emitted on, uh, in the David scintillator with the emission of two gammas of 0.5 MeV, and then by a neutron, the neutron thermalization, which in the end, is absorbed by a, by, a, by a proton, sorry, and then um, and then 2.2 MeV gamma is emitted. So the real advantage of this kind of signature is that it allows to discriminate very efficiently the grounds. So this is done by the coincidence in time, space, and energy between prompt and delayed events. So in this way, we are able to get them an expected spectrum, you can see on the plot. You can see the antineutrinos profile in um, black and uh, the other backgrounds in other colors. You see that the signal of a background ratio, thanks to the selection uh, cut sequence, is really high. You can see even by eye. The main backgrounds are given by the cosmogenic mu related um, events. For example, the lithium and helium, which uh, generates a beta and a neutron pair as our, um, our reaction. Also, the accidental coincidence, which are given by random energy deposition in the scintillator. And also, another uh, not, redu not um, reducible background is given by the geoneutrinos, which are clearly antineutrinos emitted by Earth interior. You can see. In a better way, the signal and the backgrounds here in just the previous plot in a log scale. And you can see that clearly that the most invasive background is given by the geoneutrinos itself, uh, by the accidental and by the lithium helium. Other backgrounds are really neglectable. So Juno will be able, uh, our predictions state that Juno will be able to determine the correct ma mass ordering at three sigma levels in six years. This will be done by fitting the energy spectrum against both normal ordering and inverted ordering models. And the difference of the case squares, assuming these two kinds of hypotheses, will give us the, our discrimination power. So this is the delta, you can see the delta, the delta case square profile. And you can see that, uh, um, we expect that um, the three sigma level is reached in uh, more in uh, around six years. So simultaneously, thanks to the fitting to the energy spectrum and to the high statistics, to the high signal of a background ratio, Juno will be able to simultaneously constrain the three of the um, oscillation and mass splitting parameters at 1% level. You can see the relative precision of these parameters as a function of Juno data taking time. And you see that in particular for the, 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 for the mass splittings and for the theta one, two, Juno will be able to increase the precision of, a, of more than a factor five for all of them, uh, reaching for all of them the uh, 1%, uh, more than 1% uh, precision level. On the other side, Juno is not particularly significant to theta one, theta one three. So um, this, this result will not be relevant, relevant. But Juno is not only uh, an oscillation, flavor oscillation uh, uh, related detector. So Juno is a multi-purpose detector and will be able to give us um, a lot of information on uh, other kinds of neutrinos. So for example, uh, solar neutrinos, supernova neutrinos, atmospheric and geoneutrinos themselves. For example, 
um, Solar Neutrinos will be a really interesting uh, uh, channel since uh, Juno will be probably able will be able to study both the high energy neutrinos that you can see uh, in, uh, in purple, the high energy solar neutrinos, which are given mainly by the beryllium, by, by the boron eight neutrinos, and independently will be able to um, measure the rates of the fluxes of intermediate energy solar neutrinos, so beryllium-7 neutrinos and TP neutrinos, with uh, an unprecedented precision. So um, our sensitivity studies show that Juno will be highly competitive with the past detectors, even for, for very short data taking, thanks mainly to the large mass and the excellent resolution, as well as the low backgrounds. So the construction, which is the current status of the detector. So the civil construction started uh, almost uh, uh, seven years ago, and it is expected to be completed this year. You can see on the left, in the left plot, a sketch of the uh, underground lab, and on the right side, the water pool status in September. And the four concerns, our timeline. So you can see that uh, the commissioning uh, status is uh, in a very advanced stage, and uh, therefore we expect that uh, during this year the detector will be ready for data taking, and so we expect uh, our data uh, soon. So Juno collaboration now is uh, growing more and more in time. So currently we have more than uh, 600 collaborators for more than 70, 77 institutions. To summarize, Juno will be the largest and most precise liquid scintillator detector ever built, thanks to the uh, large mass and the unprecedented energy solution. And we the first will be the first detector able to analyze the, the interference pattern due to two different uh, mass splittings. And uh, the main goal of the experiment, which is the determination of the correct neutron mass ordering, is expected to be fulfilled in six years. Simultaneously, Juno will be able to measure um, oscillations parameters at the sub percent level, entering in the uh, precision uh, measurement uh, stage. And uh, apart from this, uh, we'll be able to um, give us uh, uh, leading results in non reactor neutrino uh, field, so as uh, solar neutrinos, supernova neutrinos, and so on. And we expect that the detector will be completed the construction will be completed in the before the end of this year. So thank you for listening. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Davide. Very uh, interesting talk. Um, does anyone have any questions for the speaker? Uh, Jean? Hi, yeah, nice talk, thank you. Thank you. Um, it was just a question about the installation schedule. How long? How long does it take to actually install all of the components into the um, tank area? Okay, <laughs> this is a, a real technical question. So I don't, I'm, I don't know if I, I'm able to answer this. Um, I mean, mm, so mm, I'm, not, I'm not really able to answer this, sorry. <laughs> I, I guess that I'm kind of asking, is it is it realistic given COVID and travel constraints and stuff to be ta data taking this year? I mean, um, okay, for what concerns the COVID-related COVID situations, um, we know that the, um, the I mean, the, 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 um, the COVID set does not, uh, did not stop the, the installation stage. Clearly, there are more restrictions for what concerns traveling from abroad, so it's uh, quite difficult to, as you know, to enter in China, but uh, the local people, local scientists and engineers are working hard to complete uh, the detector. So we are not particularly concerned by this right now. Okay, thank you. Well, fingers crossed, I guess we're all looking yeah. for the results. So. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, definitely. Good luck. That looks like a very ambitious uh, schedule. Um, are there any other questions for the speaker? This is your last chance to ask a question in this session. 
Um, Jean, is that an old hand or, or do you want to ask another question? Oh, sorry, it's a legacy hand. How do I, yeah. <laughs> okay, um, then I'll, I'll ask one more question if I may. On, on slide 10, you showed this uh, uh, spectrum of events and you can see um, these wiggles. So does this include the energy resolution or is this truth information? It just looks so good, it's, it's hard. Yeah, it includes the energy, energy resolution, yeah. Okay. This and is the expected spectrum that we, I mean, this is the expected spectrum, yeah. Okay, yeah, that looks very, very impressive. Um, uh, yeah, I mean, uh, um, yeah, this is a, a 3% uh, over square, uh, root, square root of energy uh, resolution implemented here. But uh, I mean, it would be really way more evident without the meeting of the spectrum. So the oscillation will be way more evident as you can see, I mean, like this on the, you can see this is a possible spectrum without energy resolution implemented. In particular, you see on the two, three MeV region that you see the very, the very fast oscillations and uh, which are almost smeared by the implement by the including inclusion of the energy resolution. So you don't see this kind of uh, fast oscillations in the um, lower energy part of the spectrum. Um, so if, uh, I'm gonna ask another question. And yeah. I'm by no means an expert on liquid scintillator detectors, but I remember um, other liquid scintillator people saying it's very hard to get this good energy resolution in such a large detector. So how, how did you manage to get the scintillator uh, to, to behave so well on, on large distances? I mean, um, so there are mm, different kind of problems related to this. Um, if we are talking about uh, the energy resolution without considering possible uh, non-ideality non effects, the high energy solution is guaranteed by in particular in Juno by the very high PMT's coverage. So uh, one of the stainless steel, the stainless steel sphere that supports the, the photomultipliers on which the photomultipliers are mounted uh, is very dense in photomultipliers. So photomultipliers are really packed close to each other. This guarantees that all, a very, very large part of the light that comes to the sphere is collected by the, photo, by the photomultipliers. This is what we are talking about uh, when, I, when I write PMT's coverage. And uh, clearly the scintillator activity must be very high. There is another problem is related to the possible non-uniformity in the detector response. So the fact that if you have a given event at the center of the detector or in a outward position, so for example, close to the PMTs, probably the energy resolution could be different. This is another example, this is another possible problem that we have. And uh, this must be treated in some sense. We can fiducialize the detector on, or most importantly, we have to calibrate constantly the detector to understand uh, which is the correct <laughs> energy response in time. And uh, this is important to make the systematic errors under control as possible. I don't know if I, if I understand. Yeah, no, thank you. Thank, thank you. That, that's a great answer. Okay. Um, uh, Jean, do you have another question? Yeah, you sort of prompted me to think of another question. I realized I don't know. Where is the scintillator purified for Juno? Is it on site or transport? Yeah, there are some, yeah, there are some purification plants. Okay, so so are they? I, I'm just trying to sort of put it all together with the timeline. So are they sort of um, constructed and and ready? Yeah, exactly. Okay, yeah, so do you have that... preliminary information from like test batches to the the plants? Yeah, exactly. We will have some preliminary information about the scintillate the purity of the scintillator in some isotopes, and this would be important also for solar neutrino measurement, for example, which uh, crucial, crucially relies on a very high uh, radio purity levels. Okay, thank you.
Okay. Um, so thank you very much, uh, Davide. Thank you. And thank you to all the speakers in this session and for for their nice presentations and for staying on time. And uh, this uh, closes this session. And uh, please join the meeting or two session, um, which is going to be at 4.30 UK time uh, and is going to be chaired by uh, Kendall Mann. So thank you very much. And uh, that's it for this session.